give it all to us, the two things that you even had on this earth, which was your body and your blood, Lord, you sacrificed that and you offered it to us as well, Lord. And we just, we come here, Lord, and we're thankful for that. And we're at the point, Lord, where we just want to respond to the love that you've already shared. Lord, I ask that right now, after we just took in, Lord, I ask that uh, that we, we get together right now in fellowship, Lord, and we learn how we can give back. Because, Lord, no one no one wants to be in a one-way relationship, Lord, and, and we don't want to only be receiving from you, Lord, but we want to be offering as well. So I ask that when we are in your word right now, Lord, the words that you prepared, I ask that you give me the gift of prophecy that I may deliver your word to your people, Lord. I ask that these might not just be general words, but that you wrestle with hearts right now. You make us, Lord, that you correct us, that you encourage us, because, Lord, you are the perfect parent. And I ask these things with the session of our saints and our tears. Says your prayer, one voice saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Christ is all. Alright. So guys... The time has come. Today we are wrapping up the book of Ephesians. And when I mean we're wrapping it up, I don't mean we're covering the end of it. We're talking about the last thing that we want to talk about because I don't think we have any slaves or masters here and uh, some other stuff. So we'll just kind of move on. But the, the last week is something that I feel is something that's really important. It's important. You know, it was obviously important back then in the church. Sorry, I just looked at my Bible. I was hoping to throw things. Um... You'll see why, but it was also uh, important in the book of Colossians. But more importantly, I think it's really important in this church. I think it's something that in this church is very, very applicable. The thing that might have brought us to this church. Um, but before we get into all of that, Bible check. Who brought their Bibles? Her Bible. Brought her Bible. We got 10 of them. We got 10 of them. You got to buy those. Those aren't. <laughs> the free ones were from downstairs. But, look, even though this is the last, um, you know, week that we're going to spend in the book of Ephesians, I encourage you guys to bring our Bible. We should be having, a, you know, it's just, our, we're going to preach that until the day that we die. Um, can anyone remember what we talked about last week? I know it was a full seven days ago. Why is he submissive? <laughs> that was the verse that was taken out of context last week, if you remember that. <laughs> and that was part of it. But we talked about marriage, right? We talked about marriage, we talked about mutual submission, we talked about the responsibilities of being a good husband, responsibilities of being a wife. Um, we talked about all of that stuff, and one of the things that I kind of highlighted on is the fact that strong churches are built from strong families, strong families right? And although that is 100% true, you can't discount that, that is not one of the things that I was like really passionate about, because one of the things that I said is, you know, if we got strong marriages, the desired outcome of strong marriages is good kids. Or I don't want to say good kids because it's not about being good or bad. Um, but what it is about kids who love the Lord, kids who grow up in a good environment, right? Because I'll be honest, parenting is a lot harder than I had originally expected it to be. Um, I think you guys would probably agree with that. I just reflected because... Um, you know, one of my close friends just, just had their first kid. And it's hilarious because have you ever talked to like a first time parent? Like when they when they just had a kid and their whole life is like flipped upside down. They're totally overwhelmed. They have no idea what's going on. And how many kids do they have? One. <laughs> right? And you remember back to like what it was like when you had your first one. And you're like, yeah, you know, like it was really weird to have like this new guy show up. boys, the first one was the most challenging, um, and then it gets easier as you kind of figure it out. But I'll be honest with you, kids are a big deal. And I believe not only are kids a big deal, personally I think that they might be the biggest deal that's going on in, in your house. And I was talking to, uh, you know how sometimes you have a conversation with somebody and it's just kind of like permanently like burned into your mind? I remember years ago, I was talking to this affluent doctor, and this guy was like, Really, really successful. One of the stories where you know, grew up with a guy in pocket, and he took that twenty bucks and he built like a just I, I don't even know what to call it, right? But this guy just made tons and tons and tons of money. He was wildly successful. Um, and I was talking to him about all this 
It's bigger. And I was telling him, I said, dude, it is amazing that you achieved so much, right? To imagine that you came, you didn't have a lot of money, but you've just you know, become wildly successful. I said, how did you do it? And I, and I remember his response. His response is he looked at me, he said, well, I sacrificed my kids. And I was shocked. Like, I didn't even know what to say, right? So I'm just kind of staring at him, and I'm like, what? He said, well, you heard me. He said, I sacrificed my kids. I was so driven professionally. I wanted to achieve so much. I wanted to grow. You know, I wanted stability. I wanted security. He's like, I remember there were times where I would work days on end, like straight. I would sleep at the hospital because I didn't want to go home because I just wanted to work more so I could achieve more and I can do more and I can build more, right? And he says, in all of this, I sacrificed my kids because even though I was wildly successful here, I neglected my family. And as my kids grew up, they based me. And now I look at them, and they're lost. Like, they're lost. They're in failed marriages. I've got kids that are unemployed, can't hold a job. He's like, and none of them have a relationship with God. They don't go to church, none of that stuff. You know, so I feel bad for the guy, right? So I remember I was trying to, like, you know, say, hey, you know, don't feel bad. If, you know, everyone has free will. You know, you can be the perfect parent. You know, it's, the kids still go astray, you know? You say, who's the perfect father? God, he's got a bunch of kids who are lost, right? Who don't listen to him and, and do what he says, you know? <clears throat> and I was trying to make him feel better, and and I remember he just looked at me. He says, no, Peter, like, I get it, but, like, I did that. Like, that was me. It's my fault, you know? And he's on, everyone's really quick to look at all of my achievements and to praise me for it, you know? And he's on the one thing that they don't understand, the one thing that they don't see is that I would give all of it up just to have my kids back. Like, I'd give it all up. And that being said, I want to say before we even go into this talk, is that kids can grow up in great homes. You know, you can do everything perfectly as a parent or as perfect as you can, and there's no mystery formula here to make sure that your kids are going to end up being perfect. You know, actually, we know that they're not going to be perfect. And unfortunately, like even good parents, Bible-believing parents who've got good relationships tied into the community and, and good marriages, even they have rebellious and prodigal kids. Like, I get that. But what I want to say is I think as parents is we have, we have a role, you know, and we have to pay attention to our kids. We have to lo- love, nurture, and discipline them. And that's what we picked up in Ephesians 6. And, like, you know, we've been kind of talking about how St. Paul has had, like, this flow of events through uh, – through the book. And in Ephesians, he talked about in the beginning about who God is, about our response, how we're supposed to walk. He talks about what he expects our marriages to look like and how to have a successful marriage. And then what's next in line is he wants to highlight a couple things about parents and kids. And it's more than just becoming better parents or becoming better kids. What I believe St. Paul is basically saying is like, in these first three chapters, I've given you so much. Okay? Like, I've highlighted out everything that you need to know. Uh, <clears throat> now, what I talk about is how do you pass these teachings to your kids? Right? Because if we are doing the first, you know, if we're doing what St. Paul told us to do, it would affect so many aspects of our life. I believe that the number one aspect of your life that would it affect is that it would affect our homes. Because those are where people, that's, that's where they see us the most. Because if we follow what he's telling us in the book of Ephesians and what he's been teaching us, you know, it changes our identity, it changes our lifestyle, our priorities, our homes. I believe that if we actually buy into what he's saying, it'll make us better spouses, it'll make me a better husband, it'll make my wife a better wife, it'll make me a better dad, it'll make Christina a you know, better mom. It's kind of a thought for you, it's how high of a priority does a church hold children? And I think sometimes we forget this, right? Because sometimes I remember when we used to go pray uh, at a different church, you know, walking into like the crying room was almost like walking into like a leper colony. It was like chaos, right? You got kids crawling up the wall, you got moms sharing like mufaya recipes and all of this stuff. And it's just like, these are the, like, they used to throw them in this room and like no one would ever, ever care what happened to them as long as they don't disrupt the liturgy, right? And it's kind of sad because if you look back at it, you say, well, no, that, that's not right because our children should have the highest priority. A 
That's church, right? Like, this is church. You can show up on, on Sunday. You don't have a time limit. And we have kids who are literally running rampant throughout the church. <laughs> actually, we've been trying. They Actually, by the grace of God, our kids are well-behaved. But, but no one will ever be crying in the liturgy or, or is getting a hard, uh, his parent a hard time or a meltdown. Like, we expect that because it's really important for us to have these kids around. Do you know where we got that idea from? Christ. Christ was, when you look at Christ's interaction with the children, he held children to the highest regard. Matthew 19, 14. But Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven? Is he talking about, they must have different kids back there, right? Because back then the kids must have been much better behaved. <laughs> no. It was, it, that's, that's how he held them. You know, also, when you were talking, when the, when the disciples were all bickering with each other, talking about who's the greatest, right? Like, all the, they're saying, I just, I just want to be the greatest. I want this, I want that. What does Christ tell them? And if this is in Matthew 18, 3 through 5, it says, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child is Jesus. So you see that Christ here, it's, it's a total game changer. He's basically saying, guys, if you want to talk about what's really, really, really important, focus on the kids. Focus on the kids. You know, and then also compassionate. He's so loving. He's so quick to extend grace. But then... In verse 6 of that same chapter, it says, Whoever causes one of these little it is better for him to tie a millstone, or in this translation, for a millstone were hung around his neck, and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Jesus is very, very, very particular about the way we treat our children. You know, he's very quick to hold them up and to esteem them very well, but he also does not have a lot of patience for anyone who's harming them. And it's a great thing because, you know, you think about that and you figure that God's got these trusted possessions, right? These are these kids that are so valuable to him. And what does he say? He says, I'm going to trust you with the privilege of raising them. Every single one of us, we've been, we have the privilege of raising these kids. But here's the thing that I want us to think about as parents because... Time moves fast, doesn't it? Just the other night, I walked in, and I went to give Nathaniel a hug and kiss in his room, and he's 11 years old now. And I remember this kid that I used to hold, like, literally like this when he was a little baby. And, and I walk into his room, and he's, like, all sprawled out on, like, a queen-size bed. And he fills it out. And I said, dude, when did that happen? So time does fly. But we only get him for a very short time period. And these kids... These kids that we love so much, they're like wet cement, right? They're very impressionable. And if they're laying out cement, or if you've ever seen some of your hardscape being done in your backyard, you know that if you want success, you better be on it from the very, very get-go. Because once that cement starts to harden, then it's, it's very, very hard to work with. I was listening to this father, and he was talking about the first time that they gave him his, his daughter, like, in the hospital. And he says, I just remember I was holding this little, you know, this little baby. It fit in, like, two hands. And, you know, I was just looking at her, and I was kind of dazed and confused, and I was kind of having a rush of emotions, and I didn't really know what was going on. And he's like, and in that moment, he's like, I know it's a reflex, but it was what it was. She grabbed my finger. And he was just like, and then I made the biggest mistake I ever made because I blinked. And he's like, when I opened my eyes again, I was walking her down the aisle. He's like, that's how fast it travels. You know, like time travels so fast. And I fear that sometimes that we're going to miss it, right? Especially we're going to miss the time when the cement's wet, when, it's, when we have the influence we can. And we got to make sure that we don't miss out on that. In those messages that we're going to be covering 1 through 4, 6, 1 through 4, you know, I want to touch on the importance of setting a Christ-centered example for our children. Because all of these principles of everything that we've been talking about since the very, very beginning of this book of the Bible 
all we've been talking about is this should be very applicable to the way that we live, specifically the way that we should be living at home, because our kids learn from us. One of the biggest things that your kids will learn from you is about your spiritual life, your relationship with God, and whether or not it's important to you. You know, it's funny, because I wrote this yesterday, and I'm going to tell you what happened to me in the liturgy. So my exact wording was, they watch you during the liturgy to see if you're scrolling Instagram or even paying attention. They want to see how big the deal this is to you. I got a text in the liturgy today, and it asked me to look something up. Right? It was from my wife, and I will address it with her that she, not, she should not be texting in the liturgy. <laughs> but, so I was looking it up, and my kid, Elijah, looked at me, and he says, Dad, really? <laughs> We're at church. So I quickly blamed it on his mom. And I said, you know, your mom told me to look at it really fast. So I was deep in prayer before that happened. But, like, they pay more attention than we think. And I know that there's a man in my life who I respect dearly. And if I ever look at him during the liturgy, I already know exactly what I'm going to find. I'm going to see a man who's standing, eyes closed, head slightly tilted towards heaven, and deep in prayer. You know, and when I look at that man, I say that I want to enjoy the liturgy the same, right? And that should be the same exact message, right? That the fact that this guy, I know that he's focused and inspires me to pray like that. And I ask you, what message are we giving our kids here every Sunday? And I get it, because I got young kids and they're crawling all over me and stuff like that too. But I'm telling you that we need to lead by example because they are watching us. You know, your kids watch your involvement, not just not in the liturgy, but they also see your involvement here in this church. And I want you to think about that. Are you teaching your kids how important it is to serve in the church, to be involved in the church, to realize that this is not a Sunday morning activity only? Because I fear that a lot of families, they might be giving their kids an impression that this is a drive through for communion every Sunday. You know, Chick-fil-A closes on Sunday, but that's okay, because we just roll straight through the Coptic church, and we get it there. And that's not right, because that's the example that we're setting. <coughs> and it's one of the reasons we urge everyone to find your role here. You know, get involved, do something. God's given you talents and, and gifts that are specific to you to be used here for his glory. And my first thing is, is, that's the most fulfilling thing you'll ever do in your life is apply your gifts and your talents to God's glory. And the second reason is because your kids are watching you. And don't think that your kids are going to do any more than what you're going to do. They need to learn from you. They need to learn what it's like to serve. They need to learn to, to see you live out your mission that God has for you. You know, they need to see, they need to see whether or not God exists in your life Monday through Saturday. Because the fact that you guys are here, your kids all know that he's here on Sunday. But does God show up in the other days of the week? Is he involved in your life the other days of the week? You know, and the, the example is more important than what you say. You know, because we all say a lot of stuff, but we know that we can say, we can talk to a blue in the face. It really comes down to what are they seeing? Are they learning the value of, of like, and I'll be honest with you, as Egyptians, it cuts me to the core, right? Because we put so much emphasis on studying right? We put so much emphasis on good grades. We put so much emphasis on what you want to be when you grow up. You know, we even give them like maybe four options. <laughs> or a doctor. Doctor, doctor. A dentist. A tooth doctor. A tooth doctor. Yeah, I think CPA is top. I think the CPA is left me here. You can also be an engineer. But, um, <laughs> But the thing is, is, we ride them so hard on that, right? And we tell them, like, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, we got to do this. But my question is, is, do we care about their character? Do we care about their spiritual life? Do we care about their God? Or are we so worried that they're professionally going to be okay? And I'm not saying that those things are bad. But I'm telling you that in my house, I pray that they're number two. Right? and all the other stuff will come, right? So <clears throat> remember what we talked about last week, the examples that we set, right? Like I, I kind of beat this in last week. I said the examples that we set, you know, in our marriages, 
our marriages should mirror the gospel, the union of Christ in the church. You know, one of the things, the most important things they can do for your kids is to love your spouse correctly. Because, you know, I'll be honest with you, they might not understand the whole fact that marriage mirrors the gospel. But I'll tell you that I hope that one day God gives me the ability to model a sacrificial marriage for my kids. You know? And then if we're not married, you know, then we need to point our kids towards marriages that they should look up to. To say that that's the way it should be. You know? Our kids are learning obedience, respect, and submission from who? From us. Right? Whether it be from my spouse, the way, or how about the way that You know, all of those things I'm also required to do with God. So if I want my kid to learn to be obedient to God, to be respectful of God, to have submission to God, I have to model that out in my life as well because my kids are paying attention. And we know in Ephesians 5 last week, you know, it was talking about submission. Husband to God, wife to husband, and then in chapter 6, it goes straight to obey your parents. I'm going to tell you, if you are not modeling that correctly, then you cannot be surprised why you have defiant children. Because who are they learning from? Us. Right? If you think that maybe the lack of submission isn't directly tied to the lack of your own submission, where else do they learn it? They learn it from home. You know, and I'll be honest with you, this is a big task. And when I hear, when I originally started thinking about this and praying about this, like, I'll be honest, I got discouraged. You know, I got discouraged because this is something that none of us are perfect in. You know, this is something that it's not like an if we fall. This is one of the when we fall that when we talk about this stuff, especially when it comes to parenting, we all fall because we're all figuring it out as we go. But it doesn't make us bad parents. But I'm going to tell you what it does is it makes us parents that realize that we need, we are in desperate need of God's grace. Our kids will see our failures. Or is it just me? Because I feel like my kids see me fail all the time. But that's okay, though, because I want my kids to know that their dad, that their dad needs grace. You know, And I'm going to challenge all of you guys, and sometimes it's hard as a parent, to not hide that from your kids. You know, Our kids need to know that we are and they need to see how we respond to failures because we will fail in front of them. And I'm embarrassed to say that there's times where, you know, me and Christina might not be on the same page about something and the kids are there and I'm a jerk to my wife. And not only is it as if that's not bad enough that I'm a jerk to my wife, but I'm a jerk to my wife in front of my boys. And I get convicted about that. And I figure, Peter, what are you modeling here? Is this where, is it, what if one of your kids treated their wife like that? And it was a failure, right? But at times like that, what I try to do is I try to pull the kids back around. Because if they were there to see me screw up, then they should be there for me when I'm trying to make it right. And you call, you call the kids back around, and I'll look at my wife, and I'll apologize to my wife in front of my kids. Right? Because they need to see that. Like, a dad is not above apologizing. Right? And then... I would go to my kids and I'd be like, you know what? I am sorry because I did that in front of you guys and you guys should not have to see that. Will you guys forgive me? And we have to model how to fail. Because I think that we teach them not only how to fail, because they definitely will learn that from us, but they will teach us how to get up as well. You know, because they need to know that people fail. And there's this phrase that I heard before and I love it. And it says, we need to be raising sin confessors and not sin concealers. And I feel like we've got really, really good at being sin concealers, and our kids pick up on that too. And that's why it kills me when you have the youngest kids who will look in your eye and they don't realize, they don't realize it, but we know that they're blatantly lying. Because their little minds, like, you're like, dude, this is as clear as day. Like, I already, like, you were caught in your sin. You know, they're like, nope, it wasn't me. And I look at that and I say, shame on us because we need to teach them how to be sin concealers. I mean, I'm sorry, not to be sin concealers, but we need to teach them that when we fall into our sins, that we need to be sin confessors. And the best way to teach them that is for us to confess our own sins in front of them, to them, whatever we need.
So St. Paul is actually challenging the parents to do something here. And it's a very short passage, but I want to challenge you guys to think about this. Because in verse 3, in verse 3 it says um, that it may be well with you. That you may, uh, okay, I'm sorry, that's the wrong one. In verse 4, it says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in training and admonition of the Lord. And this whole bring this up thing was a little term that I, I wasn't exactly sure what it meant. Back to the original. And I, actually, I want to point out first, it says, even though that this verse is applied to fathers, I believe it's applied to fathers at minimum. I believe that both parents should be committed to this. You know, raising kids have to be on deck. I, I know a couple marriages where, you know, the dad will delegate this to the mom. And he says, yeah, you know, I'm all about making the money. I make sure that the food goes on the table. And when it comes to the kids, that's the mom. I know other situations where the mom says, hey, when it comes to anything disciplinary, I'm dad. But I'm telling you that this is all hands on deck. Proverbs 6.20. My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake the law of your mother. I pray that everyone's on the same page here. This is the job of the parents. This is something that cannot be delegated. This is not something that we hope that they take care of at school. A lot of people will be like, if I send them to a Christian school, I'm going to tell you, I don't care. Like, we do not outsource this to daycare, to school, to dance. Because I know that some of us, like, they spend more time with Tite and Gido than they might even with us. So we let Tite and Gido take care. Tite and Gido are not equipped to discipline your kids. I will say that firsthand. <laughs> I've seen the way that Tite and Gido deal with kids. They are not equipped to discipline them at all. But it's our job as parents. Right? And I'll be honest, it requires discipline. And I know whenever we talk about or start talking about discipline, you say, my kid does need discipline. But I'm going to tell you, I don't think it's the kid. Right? I think it's for ourselves. We need discipline because a lot of the times the Bible's telling us to do stuff that's very, very challenging, right? And when I start to get involved, take ownership of this. This is going to take time. This is going to take effort. You know, it's amazing. You know, we will spend a lot of time. We'll put a lot of effort in doing things so that we can acquire big houses. But I'm going to tell you all this, that's cool. But none of it's worth your kids. We cannot neglect our kids because we're building because we're building fortunes on the other side. I was talking to a buddy of mine and uh, with kids, and I said, "Hey man, so you guys have any kids?" He's just like, "No man, kids are so expensive. I don't think you do, right?" And I said, "How many kids you got?" He's all two. And I said, two's not a lot of kids." And he, I said, eh, eh, "Forgive me, but like our parents, they all had a ton of kids, right? I feel like three was pretty much the minimum." And I had buddies, like our parents raised more kids on less income. Is that true? Yeah. I would say like in my household, I know that that's true. Okay. And I look back to our parents' generation. I say, well, then how did they do it? And I'm talking about they did it and they did private schools and they did this and they did that, all this other stuff that we probably can't even afford to do now. Even though, well, what's the difference? Right? Because yeah, we also want to have Million dollar that distracts us from the kids, and the kids are the most valuable thing that we have. So, are you conscious of the time that you're spending with your kids? Like, if you really need to think about the time, the actual quality time, is it enough? Because we need to be intentional. Life is busy, and if we are not intentional, we will spend time on things that don't really matter. And then, when that time passes, we're going to look back and we realize that we missed out on a lot of stuff that's way more important. <clears throat> And it specifically tells us here, do not provoke your children to wrath. And I'll be honest, this is hard. At first I thought about it and I thought that that's okay, that's not, you know, that's, that's not, that's not a very meaningful verse. We can just kind of slide over that. And Christina looked at me, she's like, you punk Nathaniel all day long. And I was like, me? But I started thinking about it, I'm like, yeah, you know what, I'll be honest with you, I guess, I guess it is. There's a little bit of, I'm sarcastic, so like I kind of like going back and forth with them, but I guess I do kind of provoke him, you know? And it gave me to this realization that we should always have love for our kids. In any conversation, at the end of the conversation, the thing that should come out of it, even if it's disciplining them, it should be the fact that I am disciplining you, but I'm disciplining you out of love. Like, this is for you, okay? But it's easy to lose track of that. And sometimes... We forget that our kids are just kids. And we really drill down on them hard for doing something that was 
childish. But they're children. And sometimes I feel that like we might expect too much out of them. We might judge them as if they were adults. And we do. We, we kind of grind in on them. And then other times we compare. Sometimes we compare and other times we don't affirm. When they're looking for a thank you or a good job or, hey, I'm really proud of the effort you put in on that. And, and one of the things, and I've seen parents do this before, and it breaks my heart, but have you ever withheld love from your kid to teach him a lesson? <clears throat> Where your kid's sorry about something, and he tries to apologize to you, and you're just not even having it. And you're withholding love from them. That's heartbreaking. And imagine putting yourself, the, the rejection that your kid is probably feeling at that time. Right? And it's so important that St. Paul also brought it up in Colossians 3.21. And it says, Father, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. And I'm going to tell you, like, when I read that verse, I was just like, you know what? I do not want my kids to feel discouraged. I always want my kids to feel encouraged. You know, not spoiled, but encouraged. And then St. Paul moves on, and he flips it from being negative to a positive. And he tells them in verse 4, bring them up. And the, and the word that he uses, bring them up, the original translation, what it really means is to nourish or to nurture. It's a loving term. So what St. Paul's basically saying is nurture your kids. You know, pour into them. Right? He says to nurture them in, in what? It says training and admonition, which is also translated to be like, you know, to disciple them. And admonition is to give them warning. You know? And training or disciple, the thing is, is that takes work. When you're training for something, it means a, a couple things. It's something that your end goal is not something easy. It's not somewhere you get on accident. Right? Like you physically have to put forth an effort to get there. Also, when you're training, there's a difference between training and doing, right? Doing is something I can do right now. Training is a repeated process that you do over a period of time expecting a certain result. There's usually pain involved if you want to see the growth. And I'm gonna tell you, for me, when I start thinking about this, I, it's like it's like painting the lines on the highway for the kids. Right? Because the highway's wide. And there's going to be a lot of choices and there's going to be a lot of decisions that they need to make. But if we don't train them correctly to know where those lines are and to stay in your lane, then I'm really worried what that will look like. <clears throat> and how do we do that? How do we train our kids up in the Lord? And, and my thing is, is, are we diligent about getting our kids in our Bibles? Do we point them towards the church? You know, do we teach them the statutes that God has for us? Because we need to teach them God's principles, you know, that we find in the book. Because the thing is, is if we can attach them to the book, if we can attach them to the rule book, you know, the important book, the book, you know, that, that gives us life, then we know if they can accept, if they can receive it, and they can apply it for themselves, then it'll be well. We need to teach them that this, that the Bible, this Bible is not a bunch of stories, you know, there are a bunch of stories in this Bible, but the thing is, is this Bible really, if you look at it from the Old Testament to the New Testament, it's a storyline. It's a progression. Even better than that, it's a story of our God who created everything, who loved his people. They were far from him, and he had a solution for that problem. But this is a love story. You know, we need to show them that this is not just a book of rules. And although there are rules in it, when we follow this book, it tells us how to do life when it works the best. You know, now my thing is, is we can tell them all day about this Bible and how important it is, but if they don't ever see it in your hands, it's not going to mean anything. You know, I hear these great stories. I never saw this, but I hear these great stories about kids walking in on their parents reading the Bible. You know, walking in on their parents when their parents are on their knees praying for them. And they talk about the great effect that this had on them as children. And I wonder, shouldn't our kids be seeing us the same exact way? We need to teach them spiritual discipline, but we also we need to model it because that's how they're going to learn it. Our, they need to see us in prayer. They need to see us in the Bible. They need to see us you know, living out the sacraments of the church. Um, they need to understand why we do the things that we do in the church because it's very easy to, to stand here and to totally get lost in it, to zone out for the liturgy, and then to go home. But if we're not showing them the depth of why we do what we do and how we worship, then we're missing it. Right? We need to teach them about faith from a young age while the cement is still wet, before it hardens. Right? I'll be honest with you, probably one of the things that I would encourage everyone else to do, Mark and I have talked about it, and we are going to do it maybe next year, but take your kid on a missionary trip. 
take your kid on a missionary trip. I'll tell you, by the grace of God, I had the, the pleasure of taking Nathaniel with me uh, last Christmas to Kenya. And it was probably one of the best experiences I've ever had in my entire life. And I challenge you because to see, to get your kids involved, right? To see them, put them in a situation which stretches their faith, where they are in a missionary environment, where they're in their Bible, they are in prayer, they're seeing the hand of God work out. You pray for stuff, stuff happens, right? And my thing is, is as parents, I know that we push our kids to be great at sports. I see the commitment that parents are doing towards sports right now. They'll have kids, like a single kid, in two, possibly three sports. Then you've got travel ball going on, right? And so I haven't seen my, my older brother in like four months because his kids every weekend have a tournament, some, uh, tournament somewhere, right? And we push so hard at being great at sports and we invest so much there to be a great student. We invest so much there. Do we care if they grow up to be good Christians? I don't know. You know. And my final thought here before we wrap up, because I'm committed to getting out of here before this place gets raided by little kids, is if you feel that you are not sufficient as a parent, if you feel you're not cutting it, you're not doing it right, I want to tell you 100% you were correct. None of us are sufficient parents. And parenting makes us desperate for God's help because, you know, we are imperfect parents, every single one of us, but God is a perfect God. And if we were doing it on our own without him, then we would think that we don't need him. And his grace fills the gap, right? Like when he sees how hard and diligent we're trying and we're praying and we're pursuing, his grace will fill that gap. Proverbs 22, 6, it says, train up a child in the way that he go. And when he, was old, when he is old, he will not depart from it. God's grace with our effort is what we depend on. We, de- we remain desperate and we pray on our knees that even though we're going to do everything that we can, we're going to try to get it right. The thing that we pray on God's knees is, you know what, God, is your spirit that grants repentance. It is a work of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you stir the Holy Spirit inside of our kids, that they can, that they can come to a true repentance. Psalm 127, verse 1, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, the labor who build, uh, the, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It's basically saying that, God is saying, unless you're looking at me, unless you're depending on me, all of your efforts are worth nothing. It's not all you. It needs to be you. But God is a missing factor. He is the one that is in control of everything. And while I wrap up this book of, uh, of Ephesians, my final thought on this book, um, it was something that we were just talking about on Thursday night in men's group. Um, Saint, there's something different about St. Paul. And when we read his, his epistles, when we read about his life, all of the things he was able, able to accomplish, which were big things, big challenges, the way that he was led by the Spirit, and this guy had a power that, you know, other than the resurrection, I don't know if I saw anywhere else in the Bible, right? And I look at this, and, and what made him so different? St. Paul bragged about his weaknesses, and we try to hide ours. That was one thing that just, it just hit me, right? Like, and we need to stop that. And we need to admit them. You know, we need to take them to God, and we need to learn from you know, from St. Paul's relationship with Christ. Because Paul, St. Paul had weaknesses. And when he went to Christ and he asked for them to remove them, what was his response? My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That's a tough answer for someone like St. Paul. So you mean after everything that I've done, after all this evangelism, you know, staying up all night, making tents, selling in the early morning to fund my ministry. I'm doing all of this stuff, and I ask you for one favor, and you can't grant that to me? That's how I would expect St. Paul to respond. Heck, that's how I respond when I ask God something he tells me. You know. But then what was St. Paul's actual response? He says, all right, I hear you, God. If that's your plan, if your plan is to be made perfect in my weakness, then he tells you, therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon you. And I'm going to tell you, this is very applicable when it comes to parenting. 
very applicable. We all work in fast and say, you know what? It's hard to say that you're struggling with your kids. It's hard to say that you're struggling with one thing or another. But at the same time, we need to go to God and we need to tell him, God, I can't do this. Send your power that it may rest upon me. So that being said, let's be purposeful parents. Let's acknowledge the fact that we are weak and we don't have all of the answers because I believe that that is the only way that Christ's power will come and rest upon us. Sound like a deal? And glory be to God forever. Amen. So we did this. We had a service meeting yesterday. So we were talking about this thing about at the end of your talks, you should have like exit tickets. Now, we don't have exit tickets because I'm not that prepared. But what the point of an exit ticket was just for a couple people to share a takeaway from something that they just heard. So that way, it will make you think about everything that you heard, which will give you a higher probability to retain it for at least 24 to 36 minutes. So, any takeaways? We need to model the spiritual walk we want our children to have. Yes, model the spiritual walk that we want our children to have. That is actually very true. Any other? Teaching faith that's I like that teaching failure to teach success because you can't have success without failure we have to show them to fail we'll show them how to fail and get back up humbling yourself in front of your kids okay, I'm sorry I did this humbling yourself in front of your kids and telling them I'm sorry when I did that because here's the reality of it when we make a big mistake in front of our kids do they know oh yeah my kids know <laughs> Most of the time, if you messed up, if you think your kids didn't realize it, you're fooling yourself, but you're teaching them how to deal with a mess up. So we have to humble ourselves because they'll, they'll model that as well. Can I get one more? Just that they, they look at how we as husband and wife um, uh, deal with conflict. And so that's mm -hmm. going to then reflect on them and how they deal with conflict and stress and things like yeah. that. So. Yeah, we model uh, even the way that we deal with our spouses. So. Be the spouse that you want your spouse to marry is a, is a good way to kind of think about that. Because you're teaching them how to allow yourself to be treated. All right, guys, let's stand up and wrap up in prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you because these are truly words of wisdom that you have provided through your word. And Lord, so many times the biggest struggles we have in our life are just right in front of us, Lord, but we do not go to your word to figure it out because we kind of want to figure it out on our own or we think that we can, but ultimately, Lord, we are chasing our tails. Your Bible really is a lamp unto our feet. So Lord, I ask that you just, that you teach us, Lord, because although parenting is probably one of the closest things to our heart, it's an area where we acknowledge that we need you, we need your power, we need your grace, we need your guidance, Lord. It is one of many areas, and we know that your word is not hidden from us. It is there for us when we need to seek it. But Lord, I ask that you give us the wisdom to humble ourselves, Lord, to put our own ego aside, and to not think that we have things under control, but just to sit at your feet, Lord, and, and for you to share your principles on just how to do it right from the first time. Lord, I ask that you, that you bless this group here right now, Lord, that you just stir the Holy Spirit inside of every single one of us, Lord, that this might not just be seeds that were thrown by the wayside, Lord, but I ask that the seeds that you throw are seeds that show that bear 30, 60, 90, and 100 fold, Lord. Because, Lord, I ask that you train every single one of us here, Lord, and that you train us for results, that you train us with progress, Lord, that you keep our eyes on the prize, because so many times we get distracted. But we desire you, we need you, we love you, Lord, and we depend on you. I ask that you strengthen us, Lord, that you forgive us our sins, Lord. We accept these prayers, lifting sessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, faith to go St. Mary. All the saints march here. She's your prayer, one voice, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Lord, we pray. You guys are coming up here and sharing, and I think today we were blessed with food, but it was not the miracle of manna. It didn't just fall from the sky. It actually came from people in this meeting. They brought the food. There's no meeting next week, but we need people. If you guys like this environment and you like there to be food, we have to bring it. 
So, if you want to please someone sign up in two weeks for the food, that would be great. There's, there's an imaginary piece of paper floating around, and if you'd like to come sign it, So I have a piece of paper. If you'd like to sign up for the next several weeks, please sign it. And then you, if there's a lot of us that help, you might have to bring it once every three to six months, which would be great if you get fed the other weeks and those three to six months, right? Okay, let's do it.